Eh, buongiorno a tutti, eccoci qui eh, riuniti dalla potenza dell'internet, io sono Tommaso Isabella, qui con me ci sono Andrea Inzerillo, direttore del Sicilia Queer Film Festival e Mark Rappaport, regista e eh, protagonista di una delle, delle sezioni di, del Festival Mille Occhi, nonché di un omaggio diciamo, più vasto che io e Andrea abbiamo progettato e che è cominciato appunto a Palermo nel giugno di, di quest'anno al Sicilia Queer Film Fest, è continuato poi a Filmmaker Festival a Milano e si conclude con questa terza tappa con le proiezioni di Trieste che eh, noi stiamo pre-registrando questa, <ride> questa conversazione, quindi saranno insomma nella settimana del festival, ma per noi non, non ci sono ancora state. Allora, siamo qui con Mark, eh, e spieghiamo un attimo il contesto di questa, di questa masterclass che appunto rientra in una giornata dedicata ai progetti non realizzati ai film non, non conclusi eh, ma si incrocia anche con un altro eh, un progetto dell'associazione dell Anno 1 eh, che è legato a, a Pierpaolo Pasolini eh, i mille fiori di Pasolini e eh, l'occasione è come dire, particolarmente fertile perché Mark, che è, di cui presentiamo anche a Trieste parte della sua opera videografica e videosaggistica, eh, è, è un regista, è un, un critico cinematografico, è un narratore di cinema in qualche modo che ha avuto varie vite, ha, ha iniziato e <ride> anche un, am un amante dei gatti <ride> eh, Mark è, è stato appunto un regista americano che ha iniziato la sua carriera e ha realizzato dei film straordinari eh, tra gli anni 70 e 80 eh, film in cui diciamo acume invenzione, provocazione sia intellettuale che visiva sono ancora lontani dall'essere riconosciuti nella storia del cinema, e però l'omaggio che noi abbiamo deciso di fare del, al suo lavoro in Italia si concentra più diciamo, su un po' la seconda vita di, di Mark Rappaport, ovvero il punto, un punto della sua carriera in cui ha deciso non solo di, di realizzare film girati da lui, ma di appunto, fare cinema diciamo, col cinema degli altri, ovvero appunto, quello che ne fa uno dei pionieri di quello che appunto oggi si chiamiamo video saggio, ovvero appunto quella pratica che consiste nel eh, fare un discorso sul cinema eh, critico, saggistico, ma non solo, come, perché eh, Mark Rimane è appunto anche un narratore, oltre che un commentatore, ma attraverso appunto immagini eh, prese da altri film, dall'opera di altri registi, prese insomma e riciclate e riviste e poi anche montate, criticate, ri, eh, ricontestate, diciamo, dalla, dalla storia del cinema. Eh, questo è un grandissimo contributo, diciamo, che ha fatto sì che a partire dal, dagli anni 90 e poi con, diciamo, maggiore intensità, più recentemente ha fatto sì che Mark realizzasse una quantità veramente sterminata di, di queste opere, più o meno lunghe, dedicate, soprattutto concentrate sul cinema classico hollywoodiano degli anni 40 e 50, ma, ma non soltanto, ci sono varie incursioni nel cinema europeo, e tra cui, diciamo, il senso, in questo suo interesse e eh, in questa sua, come dire, no, vastissima conoscenza del, della storia del cinema, esiste anche un progetto che non, non riguarda in realtà quest'opera eh, dedicata ai videosaggi, ma, che, ma è, che è un progetto di, di film, di un lungometraggio, che mai è realizzato proprio su eh, appunto la, la vita, l'ultimo periodo di, di Pierpaolo Pasolini. Pasolini Next Film è appunto un progetto che <coughs> Mark tenta, eh, un film che Mark tenta di realizzare nel, siamo nella metà degli anni 90, se non mi sbaglio adesso ci dirà meglio lui, e quindi in un periodo in cui, mentre aveva già iniziato a realizzare appunto i suoi primi videosaggi, dal primo e celebre Rock Hudson of Movies, poi From the Journals of Gene Seberg, che è uno dei film che presentiamo qui nelle proiezioni del Mille Occhi, e mentre diciamo, ha già cominciato questa cosa, sta ancora tentando di realizzare film nella maniera diciamo, tradizionale, e appunto uno di questi progetti è proprio dedicato 
a Pasolini. Quindi per iniziare un approfondimento di questo Pasolini di Mark Rappaport chiederei a Mark appunto di eh, contestualizzarci un po', di spiegarci appunto prima di parlare di perché il film poi non è stato realizzato, qualcosa l'ha portato appunto a, a pensare e a progettare e in parte insomma comporre un progetto dedicato a Pasolini. So Mark, uh, I was just introducing the context of our conversation and uh, I'm asking you, uh, as I told you, about the context of your uh, Pasolini project, Pasolini Next Film. So what lead you to the idea of dedicating a, a feature film and trying to produce a feature film about the life and, uh, of, uh, and the works of Pasolini? How, how... Uh, quite frankly, I can't even remember why I was interested in it. Uh, I wound up looking at all of Pasolini's movies again, and including the ones I hadn't seen before. Uh, I read several biographies. I had read uh, uh, Rigazzi di Vita and uh, Una Vita Violenta. And uh, I thought he was a very, very interesting man. Not somebody you'd want to have dinner with, but uh, just a very interesting guy with a lot of contradictions. And I think it's contradictions that are more interesting than, uh, than the, well, no, let me put it another way. I, I think his contradictions are fascinating. Uh, a Marxist Catholic, uh, uh, revolutionary, uh, reactionary, uh esthete uh monster i mean it, it, there, there's so much there in pasolini's life uh that uh I, I, just a fast i of course i don't know his poetry at all and uh i don't know his essays and i certainly didn't read uh his articles that he wrote for uh, i think il tempo and uh uh but he was just a very very rich uh, in contradictions that, that i found that quite fascinating. Um, and, um, and, and the movie I wanted to make, uh, which is called Pasolini's next film, uh, neither of you have read it. Uh, so I, basically I'm talking to myself here or explaining it to you. Um, it's about the last days of Pasolini's life. Uh, and he, my, my fiction in the film, I mean, there was a film that he wanted to make, but this was not it. Uh, he wanted to make a movie called uh, something like Cosmonopolis or something like that, I, I, uh, or Oilopolis. Uh, it was gonna be this gigantic project that never, that he never uh, finished. In Italian, in Italian it's Petrolio. Petro, petrolio, yeah. Uh, uh, okay, in, in, in my film, he wants to make a film about this uh, scholar, uh, critic, uh, Johann Finkelman, who was kind of the father of uh, modern archaeology. Uh, he, was a, he was a German a Protestant who started as a school teacher uh, and was very interested in uh, uh, Roman sculpture. And um, he wrote so much about uh, um, antiquity that he was invited to be a, uh, what do you call it? A uh, archivist, biblioteca, if you like, uh, um, in Rome. Uh, and I think he was, he was invited to change his religion and, uh, and he was gay and was killed by somebody whom he tried to well, his, his death is a mystery, as was Pasolini's. Uh, well, well, Pasolini's was less of a mystery, but uh, he was killed. Uh, and it's assumed that it was like somebody that he tried to uh, make advances to. Uh, and he, was, he died at the age of 51, which was pretty much the same as Pasolini's. He, he was killed at the age of 53. Uh, so it, it cuts between the two of the stories. Uh, um, and I think uh, modestamente, I think it's it's a very good script. And I wanted, uh, uh, I wrote it with Willem Dafoe in mind and uh, 
he liked it and wanted to do it, but uh, nobody else did. So, um, so that's the, that's that story. Uh, uh, but uh, actually, Italian people have read it. Uh, there was this producer, Roberta Hajaj, uh, who said, uh, "I did you know?" He said to me after reading the script, "Oh, I was able to get it to." this writer, Barry Gifford, who was the novelist of uh, Wild at Heart, and I think he did other projects with uh, um, David Lynch. Uh, Barry was seeing uh, Laura Morante, and through Laura Morante, he got the script to uh, Roberta Hodgech, who called, called me and said he really liked the script. He asked me if I knew Pasolini. I said, no, I ne never met him. He says, because you capture him very well. So that was that was very interesting to hear, but it you know didn't really make a difference. And uh, in the fiction that I created around the real story of Pasolini's life and death, <clears throat> um, uh, Maria Callas comes to live in Rome just to be near him because she was crazy in love with him and uh, had no idea he was a homosexual. She didn't believe anything she read in the papers and until he proves it to her with uh, Ninetto Davoli. Uh, they come to her house one day and uh, uh, basically insult her uh, in a million different ways. Um, so you, you don't know the script, but, and, and I do, but that's kind of what it was. Uh, oh, I should say that uh, I was able through, again, like you have to do this, you can't do this through agents. You can't do this through producers. You have to do it like one to one to one to one. Through a friend of mine, I was able to get it to Angelica Houston to play Maria Callas. And uh, she said, uh, this is the best script I've read in months. Or maybe she said years. I I I'm going to say she said years. It was probably months, but you know, what the fuck? She can't, she, she can't contradict me and she won't. And uh, uh Basically, she said, uh, uh, well, it, the script is too dirty for her. I said, but like nothing in the script that you say is too dirty. Uh, and uh, she wanted to be in comedies. At that point, she was, I think, 51 years old. And she wanted to be, in, uh, who knows, great, a great, great actress. And it would have been a great part for her. And apparently now they're doing a, a, a Marie Callas uh, film with uh, Angelina Jolie, which I think is like perfect casting, you know. I'm buying my ticket for that. So uh, what else do you want to ask me regarding the script that you haven't read? Um, what, no, can Mark, you, what can Mark, I tell you? About that? Have, you have you ever thought to publish the, the script or you, you're considering that maybe one day you can still film it. No, I'll never be able to film. First of all, uh, the Abel Ferrara movie uh, kind of knocked that out of the water. Uh, and uh, Willem Dafoe is the only person on the planet who could play Pasolini, I think. I thought maybe Gary Oldman, but now he's too old. But and he doesn't have the fire that uh, Willem has. No, I, I don't think it's. I, I don't even dream of those things anymore. And why don't publish it as a script? Oh, I mean, tell me where to publish it. I mean, I've had no luck with American uh, publishers. Um, no one has asked me, uh, "Can we publish your your script?" Um, how do you how do you publish how do you even suggest publishing a script that's never been filmed that nobody's interested in filming uh, why would they be interested in reading it I, I don't know it, it's, it's also uh, the publishing world is uh, another planet for me I, I don't know anybody in that world <clears throat> Yeah, m maybe we can talk about this later after the meeting yeah. as uh, yeah. we, uh, we will be striving anyway to try and publish other writings of your, which okay, I think great. are as amazing as uh, your video essay and really should be read also by, by Italian readers. But uh, as we are 
a bit on the you were taking a bit of a sarcastic line talking about Angelina Jolie in, uh, in Maria no, Callas. No, no. Do you know? I, I, are you serious? Uh, okay, okay. But uh, yeah, anyway, do, do you want to comment about Abel Ferrara's own film about Pasolini or maybe we should skip it? Uh, no, no, I, I don't think it's I mean, have you, ever, have, have you ever watched the film? Yeah, I, I guess yeah, so. Of course. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was, you know, like I thought, oh my God, I'm going to have to sue because they stole everything, but they didn't. There's nothing of my film, my script in the film. And I, th I think it's a very weak film. And if you don't know who the characters are, you wouldn't, if you don't know anything about Pasolini's life, you wouldn't know anything about the film. I mean, Laura Betty is like uh, not even identified as Laura Betty or a close friend of his uh, who probably was in love with him in, in the ways that, uh, uh, a character in my film uh, is in love with uh, Pasolini and wants to make him straight. I can't believe the stories or whatever. Uh, it, I thought the film was incomprehensible. Uh, listen to me. And, and talking about, I mean, what was in, in your project and uh, relating to Pasolini, um, I'm very curious to know what was your process also in terms of the I mean, the sources, I mean, being, you, you're talking about what were your knowledge about Pasolini in terms of film and his writings, but uh, how did, I mean, were you already aware of the, let's say, the wider context, the historical context, uh, the Italian context of the, I mean, 60s and 70s, you know, I, I think that's quite interesting because uh, many times in your writings and especially in your, and in, in your video essays, you're always like intertwining, like, what is the fictional world of films and, and the historical uh, reality that it's uh, sometimes uh, beyond mm. and beneath the scenes. And so there's a lot of, of that in Pasolini life and, and over. So um, I'd be curious to know what kind of books you read uh, about him or about also the Italian context, you know, the old political historical concept of the lead years, for example, and that uh, if, if that was was something of your that concerning that that, that was of interest uh, interest uh, to you while thinking about this the last day especially the last days of Pasolini and and so so Pasolini's death that was that something that I mean you were considering and how were you researching and about this uh, well uh there i can't remember the biography uh, i i've read uh, several biographies in english I, I can't remember them but i i do remember giving my underlined biography the, the underlined biography of pasolini to willem which he probably read um i i well i think it was stuff like um oh like he was uh so violently against uh, uh, young students uh, in 68 uh, and, uh, you know, like hated them and, and, uh, and championed the police because the police came from poor backgrounds and these kids were all middle class, uh, middle class revolutionaries who were just in it for the fun. Uh, I mean, this is like so strange for somebody who was a communist and like, oh, I, you know, stuff like, um, oh, like he, he is a progressive who's against abortion because he actually said, when I was in, when I was in my mother's womb, I was writing poetry. So like, if you had aborted me, you wouldn't have uh, Pier Paolo Pasolini, uh, uh, the great artist to, uh, to adore and emulate. Uh, uh, it, it was just uh, all of these contradictions were so fascinating to me, and and also I mean in the articles that you read, uh, the contradictions in his films are just uh, mind-boggling. Um, oh, of course, Anna Magnani plays it. Well, I mean, all the women are whores and all the men are pimps. You know, it, it's like, and it you know when I first saw Akatone, I just I absolutely hated it uh yeah and especially him ennobling um uh, uh, chiti by having this uh 
uh, Bach music playing? I mean, what, what if you took the Bach music away and just put Italian pop on in the same place or uh, some kind of crappy rock and roll? Uh, it, it, it's, of course, I mean, he got the idea from Bresson, you know, the, the way Bresson used, I, I think, I don't even remember the composer, Lully and um, A Man Escaped, and it makes it sound religious because you you have this very, um, this kind of music that you associate with religion uh, and it makes it into another experience. Like the music has a life, has a life of its own here and the movie is there. Uh, I think it's much more successful in Bresson than it is in Pasolini. And, um, and I think I, I also talk about the music in uh, Medea uh, where he, I think he's like the, I haven't done any research on this, so I don't know. I mean, I may be just making this up and be totally wrong about it, but uh, it, in a sense, he's the first person to use the idea of world music, like uh, take music from uh, oh, the Bulgarian women singers and uh, Misa Luba and put them all in, uh, in uh, uh, Evangelo, uh, Matteo, uh, what, what is that? I, I... Yeah, Il Vangelo Secondo Matteo, yeah. Devon. Secondo Matteo. Uh, and like at the time, it seemed very, very uh, exciting and revolutionary. Of course, if you look at the movie now, it doesn't, as, it seems like you're like a cultural imperialist. You know, like you think everything is equal to everything else, but it's not. You're not identifying with the culture that you're stealing the music from. You're just taking it to make your film seem more exotic or to add a, a dimension to the film, to the film that the film itself may not have. Uh, and also, I mean, I think in uh, Matteo, there are too few music drops and like he repeats them over and over again. In Medea, it, it's different, um, but again, it's like, I'm going to take a little bit of this. I'm going to take a little bit of that. I'm going to take this culture. I'm going to take that culture as if everything is equal to everything else, but it's not. Uh, so I, this is something about uh, Pasolini that fascinates me. Uh, he, he's like a DJ, you know, like in a movie nightclub, adding his soundtracks to his movies to bring them to another level in a sense. Uh, and and I and I think in a way he does, uh, except it's a level that I am not appreciative of. Uh, so that's my fault. Um, other things that like other contradictions, which I I, I reread the articles I wrote, uh, like in Medea, uh, I don't think I don't think Maria Callas is talking in Italian. I think she's dubbed. I mean, if you look at the movie, uh, the lips do not sync with the dialogue. So, I mean, like one of the foremost bel canto singers of the 20th century uh, and one of the greatest singers of La Traviata and Tosca, not speaking Italian, it, it just doesn't make sense to me. But in any event, that he would dub her is just, it's just mind boggling um, that he would not use her voice. And of course, the attraction of seeing Medea is partly to see Maria Callas, who of course doesn't sing a note in the movie, um, which is another, another interesting contradiction uh, in, in uh, Pasolini because he says, uh, I'm not making entertainments. I'm not making anything that's consumable. I am against, uh, consumerism in any form, um, and yet he, you know, the star of the movie is is Maria Callas, whom that's whom you're paying admission to see. It's not like some some unknown person that he picked up off the street playing Medea. It's Maria Callas. So he needed her to make the movie, and her name is the box office attraction, as uh, Anna Magnani is in. Uh, um, Mama Roma as uh, is Silvana Mangano and 
Massimo Girati and Terence Stamp in, uh, in uh, Teorema. Um, he says he's making these indigestible products that can't be consumed, but he is also catering to an international audience at the same time. I think this is like so, for, for me, this is just fascinating uh, that you could, in a sense, he was very blind to what he was doing. He was saying one thing, but he was also saying another thing at the same time. I, I, can you really do that? Um, I'm not sure that's possible. Mark, uh, can I ask you something about uh, like how you followed he, his career, Pasolini's career? Uh, uh, Acatone is 61, 1961, if I'm not wrong. So have you, have you always watched his movies in theaters in the United States. And recently I was speaking with a non-Italian filmmaker who was telling me that uh, Pasolini was too Catholic and too homosexual and too Italian to understand for someone who is not uh, inside this culture. How, how did you uh, received his movies while watching them? I, I don't think I saw... Uh, uh, first of all, they were released in different times. Uh, I think Akatsutani was not... I, I don't remember when it was released in America, but I, it wasn't released the year it was made. Uh, Tea Rema was a big hit. Mama Roma, uh, despite Anna Magnani, I think was released later than when it was made. So there, there wasn't that kind of uh, you're keeping up to date with the uh, the artist's schedule. Uh, everything was like really seen in different order. I mean, the same was true with with Visconti's movies. Uh, you could never, you wouldn't see them uh, as they were being made. Uh, La Terra Trema was released uh, twenty or thirty years after it was no, not thirty, twenty years after it was made. So. Uh, in a way, you couldn't put movies like Bellissima and Senzo into a context with La Terra Trema because you saw them much later. Uh, I, but I, I did go through all of his movies uh, fairly systematically, Pasolini's. And um, too Catholic, I, I'm not sure. Too homosexual, I'm not sure. Too Marxist, I'm not sure. I mean, I would say that more uh, to Catholic, more Rossellini's uh, uh, territory. Uh, I think that I think you have to be Catholic to to love Rossellini, but I, I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, well, uh, Ingrid Bergman wasn't, but um, uh, but he he punished her in movie after movie for not being a Catholic and for not being Italian and for not loving spaghetti. Um, the way he did. Um, so in answer to your question, I mean, I just did as much research as I could in not speaking Italian, uh, but having uh, very strong opinions of my own about his work. And um, I mean, I realize his importance as a filmmaker, but it's nothing that touches me personally. I, I do think that one thing that's very interesting about Pasolini is that he was using from, I, th I think it either, if it's not with uh, Akatone, it, it starts with uh, uh, Matteo uh, um, using handheld camera. And, uh, I, you know, I, I say in one of the pieces that I wrote, uh, it's as if he had to do everything in a hurry because he knew he was going to die. Uh, so it's like handheld camera. Okay, let's do the next shot. We got it. Like, don't keep the actors waiting with uh, setting up with lights and with the tripod and, uh, and you stay here and you stay there. We, we just do it as, as it's being unfolded. And then, of course, well, and, and in Portugal, uh, all this stuff uh, with Pierre Clemente is handheld and uh, the stuff in the German Chateau is all like very rigid and 
fixed and cameras fixed uh, on, on a tripod. And uh, in, in, in Salo, it's also very fixed because in a way he was, he, I think part of him knew that it was his last film um, uh, because it was so outrageous. Uh, and so upsetting and so annoying um, that e everything is like done very perfectly. Uh, the actors are placed here, the cameras placed there, uh, uh, but it's not. It's not. I don't think it's handheld. Uh, it's, it's been ages since I've seen the movie, but I don't think it's handheld. And oh, another contradiction. This is very important. I mentioned this to you, Tommaso, that uh, I knew from a, a very reliable source that when they're eating shit, it's made by Souchard chocolates. So this is like, he would go to the top of the top chocolate producers to produce something that looks like shit, but tastes like Souchard. I mean, this is such a contradiction of the way he, the way he presented himself as I want to make a uh, work that's indigestible uh, cannot be consumed, literally cannot be consumed. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I, I just think it's, um, it's almost hilarious. Um, the, uh, the way he didn't know, it, it was like he had two parts of his brain and one part didn't know what the other part was doing. Uh, of course, I mean, he's much smarter than all of us. He was much smarter than all of us, but but still, I mean, there was an unconscious part of him that uh, was trying to be a populist uh, and a popular filmmaker. Why else would you go after um, Maria Callas? Originally, he wanted Rita Hayworth. Um, this is this is not this is this is as weird as Bresson asking George Cukor to introduce him to Burt Lancaster and Natalie Wood to play in um, uh, Lancelot, Lancelot. This is, what are they talking about? Could they really be serious? Uh, and, and of course, uh, I mean, like, very simple kind of star fucking, like having Anne Wiesemski in his movies because she was Anne Wiesemski, um, the daughter's wife, the, the star of Oleta Baltazar. Uh, she was a commodity for him, as was uh, uh, Pierre Clementi and, and uh, uh, you know, Jean-Pierre Léo. I mean, Jean-Pierre Léo was very famous as the star of New Wave films, uh, Badar, Truffaut, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, you, how can you say one thing and do the exact opposite? It's, I mean, in a sense, he contradicted himself as he, in, in one sentence, over and over again, he would contradict himself. And I, I, I enjoy that in a way. Yeah, just, it's very fascinating. And just let me stress you how, I mean, the chocolate shit anecdote is, just one of many examples how, yeah. I mean, the knowledge of, no, no, but your kind of knowledge and how you, you can take this kind of almost gossipy details and turn it into elements for uh, an in-depth analysis, which is always fascinating in your work. But, but, um, but, but wait, it, it's, not, it's not gossipy details. I mean, also no, no. Piero Tozzi, who did the costumes uh, for uh, in Medea, I mean, he was like a great, great, artist in, in his way and uh, the costumes are fantastic uh, and very beautiful and uh, and and very effective but uh, again like it wasn't like he would get rags from wherever and like have the actors walk around in rags uh, he wanted the top of the line uh, costume designer and uh, according to Piero Tosi, he, he, he Piero Tosi, did a lot of research and combined elements from, uh, from many different cultures to, to come up with the designs of the clothing and the jewelry. 
um, and they're gorgeous. So. Yeah, yeah, no, of course, this is the, I mean, this, the, re, the very stuff cinema is made of, uh, in a way. And uh, I was just thinking while you were talking, how your kind of, let's say, fascination, but also very critical and uh, towards Pasolini, sort of this kind of this contradiction, in a way, maybe, and I mean, reading your articles, we, are, we quoted without actually explaining that much, but they're, uh, of course, they relate to, as we said, Porcile and Medea. Uh, seems to me that maybe one of the points that you can, I don't know, at the same time relate to him and uh, be feeling some kind of distance uh, is exactly what, how you talk about how he was, I mean, not just making cinema in a way like a filmmaker normally does, no? He was in a way making something with cinema. He was always, mm. he was always saying something like that, a poet that is using cinema for some kind of his own project that wasn't just in the films. So, and uh, I mean, that, that's a bit of a provocation on my part because I think that in your own way, you're also using cinema, the cinema of others in this case, in making something with cinema that is, I mean, cinema in uh, on its own merit, in fact. But uh, I think that maybe that this uh, kind of very, let's say uh, tense relationship with him not tense but like contradictory relationship comes also with that that you, that you can't really just take him as a as a director uh, as other director that you maybe also I mean you're interested in but also admire on a different level I'm thinking about what we already quoted in uh, Visconti that I think is one of your dearest in, in from I mean from Italian cinema but in general all the other directors that you were uh, keeping uh, going uh, in talking about in your writings and, uh, and and your video essay might be something like that that is a uh, is very peculiar position inside scene inside and outside cinema that fascinates you but also keep you at distance you know in some kind of way well I, I should do I say yes or no to that? <laughs> um, well, I I think uh, oh, shit. I can't remember what I, what I was thinking. Uh, mm. Well, uh, I think Pasolini has said that uh, when he made Acatone, and that was followed by Mama Roma. I, was that is that correct? Uh, that he was interested in. Uh, uh, shooting movies in ways that uh, uh, Giotto or Masaccio would have uh, uh, painted them. It was like always frontal camera. Uh, the actors would face the camera. Um, um, and, uh, and then he discovered how movies are made through, through those movies. And, and uh, was Matteo the next one? Um, I should have I should have checked this before for this meeting. Well, anyway, but I mean, he he changed his philosophy of how movies should be made, and uh, uh, was not so uh, strict with himself uh, as he was in the first two films, uh, or uh, not in the first two films. He was shooting as if it was an ideology. He wanted to show that Italian cinema could be like Italian painting of the uh, 14th and 15th century, but uh, uh, I'm lost here. <laughs> Help me out. Um, uh, yes, you were right, Mark. Il Vangelo secondo Matteo is the third one. I thought that Uccellaccio Uccellini was before, but no. Uh, it's Il uh, Vangelo secondo Matteo. Yeah, I mean, there's some shorts in between yeah. the episode in the episode films, maybe Comizzi the Morris of this around the same time, but yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and and also uh, oh, Toto using Toto uh, again. It's like I will get like the most famous comedian in Italy uh, in a movie that you're gonna hate, you know, in a movie that you don't want to see. But maybe um, maybe the use of Toto, it's like when you were saying populistic or popular, it's his work on popular culture, which is not only Toto, but also with other Italian actors, very known Italian actors, uh, for example, in a movie, uh, Silvana Mangan, of course, and, and uh, Anna Magnani and, and many others. 
And uh, for example, in this uh, uh, great movie, uh, whose name is Che Cosa Sono Le Nuvole, you know, the, the Otello uh, movie he made. Uh, he made a movie uh, like in a puppet theater with all very, very known um, comic uh, actors from mm -hmm. Italian comedy, uh, Franco Franchi, Ciccio Ingrassia, Totò, Ninetto Davoli, Laura Betti, and Domenico Modugno, and who is Modugno. the singer of Volare. So he was working on mixing popular culture with popular with Shakespeare. So so it was, it was uh, like he was working on that for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. you said you weren't familiar with these essays, but uh, one of your movies uh, was screened in Pesaro, uh, isn't it? I, I don't remember if casual relations or yeah. some something else, because Pesaro was the festival where he Pesaro, yes, uh, yes, uh, where yes. Uh, uh, so Pesaro was the the festival where he who, where he got started. Uh, no, not not as as a film essayist, where his poetry cinema as a poetry was written for. Uh, ah. There was a big discussion in Pesaro with many other filmmakers. Maybe Tommaso can tell it. Yeah, I mean, uh, Pesaro at the time was uh, kind of a center for the discussion, especially on semiotics and cinema. So Umberto Eco, Christian Metz and other, I mean, intellectual and critics were gathering there to discuss these also new approaches of film theory. And, and Pasolini was participating in it mm. with this, uh, the writing that you actually also quote, I think I uh, was reading in your writing. You at least quote uh, Cinema di Poesia at certain point. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, so, so you are at some. Yeah, but so it was also uh, an important in terms of discussion of, about cinema and about the theory of cinema and all the, you know, structuralist and post structuralism and views on of cinema at the time. So it was a very, I mean, lively, yeah center of confrontation for the, mm. for the time and Pasolini was in there yeah and I think you you, you were telling me the other time the casual re relation was uh, your very first screening in Italy was in yeah, Pesaro yeah. I think yeah. so yeah, it was yeah. my first uh, my first uh, yeah. screening in Europe yeah mm. I knew okay yeah yeah and and uh, I, I don't know what uh, Andrea what were you curious to uh, uh, no, 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 I was, I was just asking if uh, uh, Pesaro meant something for Mark at at the time because uh, it was like uh, this article of Pasolini's like sixty early sixties, no. So uh, mm -hmm. I'm I'm not sure if if he yeah. he did know something about it. No, yeah. okay. Yeah. Uh, no, and, and the other question I wanted to, to ask you is maybe you, you wrote this essay in this French uh, Le Spectateur qui en savait trop, The Spectator who knew too much. Uh, the, the last essay you wrote is uh, called Confessions of a Latent Heterosexual. And, and uh, I was curious if uh, Pasolini, as an overt homosexual, interested you. Uh, as many others, uh, like Eisenstein or other gay filmmakers, uh, with whom you have worked on, like in your video essays, is that dimension of homosexuality in Pasolini something that interests you beyond uh, his? Uh... No, no, no. Okay, I, I, uh, to speak in the in the vernacular, I don't give a flying fuck about who's a homosexual and who's not. It's of no interest to me. It's it's interesting if you think if it's a great director, but like a director, I've had no interest in ever uh, Fassbinder. I don't care if fuck chickens, you know. It's like it does has, has nothing to do with me. So. So, well, but I, in order to get back a little bit on the Pasolini next film, uh, which I was curious to be, what was the next film in, in your film? But I, I mean, you, you, you were talking about, uh, you told us about uh, this kind of parallel uh, story and reference to Winkelmann uh, and his death. So, I mean, it, 
did the death of Pasolini and, and, and his case, I mean, were like featured in some way and how in, in, in the film? Or was it just about the last days and you weren't really concerned about, I mean, what, I mean, the historical happenings and, uh, and, and his death? Was, was that something that was featured in the film in some way? Yeah, it, was... I think it, it is. Uh, I mean, like the communists hated him, the, the right hated him. Everybody hated him. I mean, he made enemies everywhere. Uh, uh, I mean, saying that the mafia um, uh, was involved is very possible, but uh, um, I mean, he had and he had enemies on on every. Oops, hold on a second. Oops. Oh. Uh, I mean, I, I'm sure that his death was uh, planned, uh, and 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 I'm sure all the boys that he exploited uh, must have hated him. Some of the boys whom he exploited must have hated him. But it's just, I yes, it, it the movie is is very concerned with his last days and. Uh, uh, and I think that with Salo, he he really realized that he had come to the end of a line. Uh, where do you really go from Salo? I mean, a light for the comedy, uh, you know, in Hollywood <laughs> with Doris Day. Uh, it, it's uh, it, it's very hard to imagine what could be next uh, after that. It's a, to me, it's such a nihilistic film. And also, oh, the, another thing that I kind of think it's worth mentioning that there's this whole string of Italian movies at that time that equate fascism and ho and uh, uh, not homosexuality, especially, but like uh, fascism and uh, and sex uh, and sex, Sa fascism, and sex, but like dirty sex it's not straight sex it's like perverted sex oh there's like night porter and uh, the conformist and uh um, maybe also visconti visconti yes the uh, the day like yeah yeah uh, I, I mean and i find that so furious it makes me furious that fascism can be reduced to that simple a thing that this kind of sex equals fascism or fascism and sex are this kind of thing. Uh, fascism is, is a very different kind of thing as we're finding out in America. It's, uh, it's not exactly fascism, uh, textbook fascism, but like, uh, I think it's, like, it's an evasion to um, conflate the two the uh, perverted sex with fascism. Uh, it's very creepy. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not in a position really to talk about it in depth, but uh, I think there's something there for somebody to write about, which I I don't recall ever having seen anything written about it. And, and it's a particularly Italian kind of uh, relationship to fascism. And... Uh, that, that most of Salo it, it deals with that as a sexual perversion, I think is ignoring the issues um, and what fascism really means and can do. So that's my take on it. Okay, I think we, yeah, we could go on for longer talking about, I mean, this, but I'm more interested in drawing another kind of a parallel if you allow me between uh your works and and, and this matter of Pasolini is that because you know there's I mean I think you also kind of alluded more or less explicitly in your uh, article about Porcile which by the way is called the autobiography of Pasolini so it's already relating I mean to his life about I mean some kind of parallel between I mean the end of uh Julian of the character and uh, so the Jean-Pierre Leo character get eaten uh, by 
by the pigs and and uh, we loved and uh, puzzling is that. Uh, so, and you know that, I don't know if you read at the time, but there, there has been some kind of fringe theory that uh, some, some authors that arrived to the point of, of seeing that in a way, Pasolini's own death was kind of a conclusion, <laughs> as you were alluding, yeah, kind of a conclusion of, of, of his work and life. And you know that also there's a Pasolini's article, uh, one of them, I don't know if you ever read it, that, talk, that start talking about the the Zabruder film and the, uh, the death of J JFK and uh, mm -hmm. how, you know, he's talking about how this, like, plan sequence, this long shot and, and, and the cut that ends, the like, this the montage cut is, in a way, makes a parallel between death and, and, and death that gives a, a meaning to the whole life and so, to, or in, in cinematic term, the, 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 the cut of montage that, creates the shot and its dimension. So it gives, in, in a way, its own sense. So there, I mean, there's been, uh, and I think it's quite interesting in a way, and I don't know if you ever thought about this, but I mean, because you, you've been dealing a lot uh, with the life of actors uh, and uh, in, in your video essays and in your writings. And I would say that, I mean, to me, it's always seems that many times, uh, I mean, it's like an overarching thing uh, in your works is how the life of this person, I mean, the fictional and the real life were in a way scripted and written by, by the industries that they were working on. So uh, I'm just wondering if like, this fascination with Pasolini comes also for with a character that in a way, being a director was also uh, in a way scripting his own life and 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 deciding for his own and I mean very differently from the the life of the actors that you sometimes talk about that are more seem more uh, passive in a way they they're subject to happenings and uh, lot I mean industry logics narratives that are in a way imposed on them starting of course from Rockatson and his male. Uh, virile figure and, and the homosexual he was in his real life. I, I mean, if this, I mean, if you ever thought about about this, um, this very different and very, let's say, authorial kind of, of approach to, of Pasolini to his works, but also his own life in a way. And this was very cautious. Oh. I mean, not, not just about his death, I mean, but also about, I mean, how, I mean, he, he was crafting very carefully, and even if we did this lot of contradiction we talked about, uh, crafting his own character, in a way, his own uh, persona, like I mean, his own figure. If that's something that interested you. In, uh... Uh, well, actually, I, I want to ask you, do, do you think it's possible to uh, uh, get copies of those articles or one of them translated uh, and given out at the screening, uh, you know, part of the Pasolini thing. Uh, I mean, it's very short notice, of course, but. Uh... Yeah, okay, I mean, well, me... we might give it a try, but uh, I don't know because actually, yeah, I mean, we might talk about it later. I mean, we, okay. we could, yeah. Uh, but, uh, okay. yeah. Okay, sure. well, okay, like in, in Portugal, uh, uh, Pierre Clementi says proudly, I have. I killed my father, I ate human flesh, and what's the third one? Uh, I cursed God and die, something like that. Uh, I trembled with joy. I don't know exactly the English I translation, with, but, but it's something. That's it, better than I cursed God and die. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, uh, as I said in the article, like I killed my father, but I mean, this is like, this is totally acceptable in Western literature. I mean, this is like, Hamlet, Oedipus Rex, I mean, this is all they talk about in, in Freudian therapy, like, you know, killing the father and taking the mother. Uh, so like, it's not, it's not that interesting that Pierre Clementi says that. What he doesn't say is that I want her to fuck my father. That, that's what, when people asked, when people said uh, that, Pasolini had an Oedipus complex. He said, no, I didn't have an Oedipus complex. I never wanted to fuck my mother. I wanted to fuck my father. Now, this is so far out of reach that the Bible couldn't deal with this. And it wasn't even a societal no-no uh, because who would even think of that except Pasolini? Uh, 
Um, so, I mean, I killed my father. It's like, it's not such a big deal, you know, in a way. And, uh, oh, I've had arguments with psychoanalysts and psychologists. Like, do you really think that Freud was, that Freud stories like really apply to everybody in the world? Like everybody wants to kill their father and sleep with their mother. Do you really believe that? And they also, oh yeah. I, it's like such a bag of shit. It's like you're dreaming. Everybody in the world does not conform to this recipe. It's not possible. Um, anyway, I think that I killed my father is not such a big deal. But he doesn't say, I killed my father and then fucked him, which I think is what Pasolini really meant or wanted to say, but actually didn't have the guts to say it. I mean, he does it. You asked about me and uh, my interest in homosexual directors. He doesn't, he can't even deal with homosexuality in any of his films, unless I'm mistaken. No, I. No, I think that's true. I think that's true. And uh, here was a man who is, well, uh, maybe Terence Stamp and Massimo Girardi, but I don't, I don't know. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I, I, I think that uh, it's disguises and evasions, um, but somehow knowing the truth that, that he was in fact going to die the way that Pierre Clementi dies and uh, the way the kids die in Salo, it, it, I mean, I think there were intimations of that in in his life. He, he understood that uh, there was only one way out. I mean, of course, we're all going to die, but there's dying early and there's dying later, a natural death. And, and I think the way he tempted fate by picking up strangers night after night after night after night was like another way of uh, uh, kind of defying destiny. I mean, it's, it's very dangerous. It is very dangerous to, uh, to do that. Yeah, yeah, maybe it was also a way to push life until until yes, death, to the limits. And, yeah, to the limits. And yeah. um, speaking about uh, the idea that just Pasolini could have of not killing but fucking his father, uh, I'm not sure you're familiar with this sentence he said in uh, uh, maybe also. I don't know if Moravia says it in Covici d'Amore, but for sure Pasolini says it in one of his last interviews. Uh, he said something like, I think scandalizing is a right, being scandalized a pleasure, and anyone who refuses to be scandalized is a moralist, the so-called moralist. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's interesting. I, I can, yeah, I can... Uh... I certainly can put that in the in the basket with the other stuff, with the the contradictions uh, in all of his films and in his life. Marxist, communist, homosexual, Catholic, reactionary, uh, uh, maybe even fascistic, uh, the fascistic communist. Uh, you know, like I, I hate the May May sixty eight revolution because. It's not revolutionary. I don't want education for for uh, for children because it's going to make them all bourgeois consumers. I'd rather have them ignorant and uh, and as the people pointed out to him, yes, and so you could fuck them and pay them uh, twenty lira. Uh, yeah. So th this is a contradiction that that's very interesting. To be scandalized is uh, is good. To be the subject of scandals is. Uh, very necessary for some people. Tommaso, do you want to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we can go to because I, I was just saying, provided that they, they cut the hair also, because that was another right, famous, right. Uh, yeah, article it, it, and, and polemics about the early boys. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, of Pasolini. Um, yeah, no, I, I just 
try. I mean, I don't know if uh, Andre, if you want to add something, but uh, we can draw it to a close. And uh, I'd like to get back uh, just for a moment at the beginning and the context of this uh, conversation that is about unrealized project. And uh, as I was mentioning briefly at the beginning, uh, I mean, provided that yeah, you will never make this film about uh, right, Pasolini. Yeah, no, it's, and, it's, it's, been, it's been made, you know. Yeah, so. yeah, 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 I mean, it's been made, but it's another. But this is uh, really, I mean, I think uh, it's almost, uh, I mean, it's a very interesting, uh, how we should say, I mean, coincidence that the fact that you, I mean, so also this film would be stored in, I mean, in what you call in one of your video essays about Max of Fools, the cinematheque of the film that never been made, or something, yeah. Some, yeah. something like that, no? And uh, I think that that's a very fascinating concept. And and uh, I continue. I mean, I was wanted to ask you how you're interested and in how we, you draw some kind of inspiration of, of, from this uh, unwritten history of cinema that you always provided that all all your essays in a, in a way or another are always going back and trying to revision and and uh, in a way rewrite some history that's in the films but this is a, a, another layer that it's so almost uh, i mean more open to speculation and to fiction and to invention uh, that is the the idea of the film that were never made that never things realized so uh, how I mean, how is it? This is some something uh, that that it's really part of your work. I mean, uh, how you get interested in this idea, or you go search for it. I mean, you just don't. I mean, this is also information that sometimes you need to. I mean, go search, uh, and it's not. I mean, maybe in some cases it is, but in other, I mean, some famous cases it's not common knowledge. And it seems to me that you have a very keen interest in find this kind of fact on, of of. Uh, Let's say also hypothetical history. What could have been if if a film was wasn't made in this way? Like for example, if Medea was uh, played by Rita Hayward and not Maria Callas, for example. Right? Just to get back at Pasolini. Well, I don't think anybody's going to cry bitter tears that I didn't make my movie. You know, uh, maybe I will, but nobody else will. Uh, there were millions of movies that never got made. Uh, Eisenstein's movies, were, his Mexican film was like kept from him and uh, cut up by, in a million different ways by many, many different people and made into movies that he would never have approved of. Uh, his film, Bayesian Meadow was destroyed. Uh, movie history is filled with projects that never got made. Uh, there were Bunuel movies that never got made uh, that I would love to have seen. There were there Visconti movies that never got made. Uh, he was going to make The Magic Mountain. I, th I think it's very good that he didn't make that, but you know, I, I don't I don't think that's a very good project uh, for anybody to to take on. But uh, I, I think that's the history of artists. Uh, no one will cry for the unmade. Uh, novel, the unfinished novel, the uh, unfinished symphony uh, that you uh, think is really great. Uh, this is the history of art. Uh, not everybody uh, makes it to the top. When we were in the museum in Brera with you, uh, you, know, you would see like one or two paintings by this art, an artist you never heard of. And you said, well, where are the 200 other pieces that this person made. Well, they're lost forever. I mean, who is gonna cry about this except the artist and his mother? Um, that's fucking life. Um, and uh, I am sure there are lots of, uh, well, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure there are that many great movies that never got made, but I mean, even Hitchcock had you know, projects that never, that could never be released, uh, not released, not released, uh, uh, um, uh, realized. Uh, there was a movie he wanted to make with Audrey Hepburn where she gets raped. And he, she said, I'm not going to get raped in any movie. And she said, I'm not doing this movie. 
And he said, I can't do this movie without Audrey Hepburn. Uh, well, if you can't, you can't. Uh, well, too bad for him, too bad for her. Uh, and, you know, then there's this other story, this other Hollywood story, which I'm not interested in digging into the details of it, but how many movies got made despite the fact that the actresses who were originally cast were pregnant and couldn't be in the films. Um, I can I can name you like half a dozen, and uh, it, it's just a it's a, it's a horrible story. Um, worse for women, of course, than for men. Uh, Sid Charisse was supposed to be an American in Paris, but Leslie Caron got the part because she wasn't pregnant at the time that the movie was being shot. Uh, this is, um, and then, then she got revenge by becoming famous two years later. So uh, uh, it's a world that you can't control. And uh, if you could control it, it probably would be a very different place. Um, so you can elect me as the emperor of art, the whole world, if you want, want to, and maybe we'll get the movie made. But Short of that, it's not going to happen. Uh, it's just there are too many uh, dead scripts, and uh, you know, on the highway to uh, to fame and fortune, it just doesn't happen for everyone. And a lot of scripts uh, get changed to beyond uh, recognition by the time they're finished by the producers. So. Um, we said we cry sad tears over the, the artworks that have not been made by artists who died young, uh, by uh, poets like uh, Keats and Shelley. Who what 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 if they had lived longer? What would they have written? Uh, it's a it's a mystery, and you can't solve it, and you can't uh, uh, you can't fill in the blank spaces. Yeah, yeah, sure. But it, it's not just, I mean, who's cry over over this, uh, but it's also, I mean, I really can sense some fascination about, I mean, about these uh, facts or these non-facts, these non-happenings, exactly because they're some kind of territory where, I mean, it's like the fiction, the fictional world of film cannot really lift itself from the matter of fact of reality. They cannot become films. So they, 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 they like, they remain blocked. And I think that in your films over and over again, you're always like, in a way, exploring and wandering in this kind of territory that is uh, what's in the film and what's beyond the film. So that, uh, that's, I think it's a, the very interesting part. And, uh, and in a, just, to conclude, I would, uh, of course, uh, uh, provocatively ask you, would you ever consider making a, 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 a video essay about, about Pasolini works? I mean, tackling in a way what was interesting for you in the, in the film project uh, and also maybe in, in, the, in the critical writings that you made that are, by the way, quite different because uh, many times you use a very narrative approach uh, while writing your uh, even in your uh, film writings, in your critical writings, but these are not actually. They really, they look much more like normal, let's say, critical articles. Nor so would you, I, yeah, let's say in Thank a way. You. But uh, normally, in, in terms of style, I mean, you're, I mean, yeah. we must, we must, we need to mention that many times, many of your writings takes a very fictional aspect, and where you have the, the I mean, the, the topic of your maybe the an actor or director speaks. Uh, in, in the first person, and it's really mm. it's not just a, it's not just a critical essay, you know, it's it's also a narrative work. And uh, so, would you, have you ever thought about? Would you ever consider doing something? Maybe not. I mean, a, a video essay about I mean the same thing that you were dealing with uh, in in your film uh, feature film project, but something about Pasolini. Did you ever cross your mind? No, not really. No, um, it's uh, no. No, I, I mean, I have, I have ideas for six more after the one I'm finishing up now, and he's not on the list. Um, uh, actually, what you say is kind of interesting. I mean, if they, if they, 
video distribution company said, well, we'd like you to do this, I, I would probably be interested in doing it. But I, as a self, uh, self-propelling self project, I, I, I'm not kind of, not that interested in it. So anyway, I've, I've done it. You know, actually, the, the act, I don't like Pasolini's films, but I try not to show that in the articles I wrote. Uh, and I think I told you, Tommaso, that uh, Criterion wanted me to write the liner notes for uh, Salo. And I told them, look, I hated the film, but I think I have interesting things to say about it. And they said, oh, no, 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 we want somebody who loves the film. Well, I don't know that it's a film that anybody can love. You could admire it, but can you love it? <laughs> And can you can you watch it more than two times? Uh, can you watch it more than three times without throwing up? I mean, you know, I don't know. Uh, I know people who do these kind of commercial video essays, uh, the the uh, the late films, the late forgotten films of Otto Preminger. Not so interesting. Not so interesting. Um, yeah, uh, I, I would do it if there were a reason to do it. I, I don't, I don't feel there's a reason for me to do it. Maybe we can push someone to ask you to work on Pasolini with the story you told us. Maria Callas coming in Italy, falling in love with Pasolini and Pasolini having sex with Ninetto or something like that. Well, it's in my script. So I, I don't have to do it again. Uh, besides which, I, I'm not prepared to research, to do all the research that I did. Uh, oh, it was like 23 years ago. You know, it's just, uh, I know I'm much more concerned with getting out the, the films I wanted to do right now. Yeah, no, I, I think that would be a, an interesting, uh, monologue for Maria Callas or, uh, or Ninetto, you know, uh, but I'm not the one to do it. So thanks for the offer. <laughs> Too bad, I would say. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, in a way I've done it. So No, no, the things I'm interested in, they like go in a different direction and, and, and they're not all in the same direction. So um, this would be very far afield for me in a way. But why Angelica Houston wouldn't say yes? Well, you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is if the, if the film had been financed and you say, okay, $300,000 for two weeks of work, that's very different from saying, would you commit to this project by somebody you never heard of that isn't funded? So, you know, if you make an offer, it's different than signing your name to a, uh, uh, to something that's as, as substantial as a cloud in the wind, you know, maybe next time. Yeah, that's, that's the cruelty of the industry that you, talking yeah. about, I yeah. mean, many times about, but luckily you became like some kind of cottage one man band filmmaker. I, and, I, uh, I had to, I had to. Yeah. Uh, Puzzle, uh, the Puzzle in his next film was the, uh, the last script, last feature length script I wrote. I'd written about 10 of them. And I thought it was like the best thing I'd written at that time. And I said, I, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to write scripts that are not going to get produced. Uh, uh, I don't need like a row, you know, a shelf full of unproduced scripts. It's not necessary in my life. And then I, I you know, I was writing uh, essays instead. And then I started making videos by myself. That for our, I mean, pleasure, you're continuing doing it, so. Well, thank, well you. <laughs> thank you. I will say we can uh, like put back on on the shelf of the Cinematheque of unfinished film uh, puzzle in the next film and okay. And thank you, Mark and and Andrea. Thank you, Mark. And thank you. For, uh, well, I ho I hope you got what you wanted. I mean, I 
you know, I don't know. Did did you get what you wanted, or you don't know what you wanted? <laughs> never, you never, never know. What, never know. 